Today's episode is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible is a seller and producer of spoken audio entertainment, information, and educational programming on the internet. Audible sells digital audiobooks, radio and TV programs, and audio versions of magazines and newspapers. To start using Audible today, please visit their website at www.audible.com. That's www.audible.com. So sorry for the interruption, but we have a quick announcement. We've just put together a quick app to consolidate past and upcoming episodes of this show. To download the app, simply use your cell phone camera to scan the QR code on the screen. Then, simply add the app to your home screen for easy access and a better experience. Welcome to another episode of Taking You to the Top. In this podcast, Rami spends time speaking with founders and CEOs from across the globe and asks them specific questions to learn exactly how they launched their businesses. Before we get started with today's guest, please follow Rami's Instagram account so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. If you'd like to watch previous episodes, simply click on Rami's IGTV section or scan the QR code at the beginning of this video to download the app. If you'd like to get more information and analytics about each guest, simply visit the podcast website at takingyoutothetop.cf. Now, let me spend a moment to introduce today's guest before Rami gets started. Today's guest is the founder and CEO of ProfitWell. For forward-thinking recurring revenue businesses who value growth, ProfitWell provides industry-standard BI solutions that improve your retention and monetization automatically through unmatched subscription intelligence. Join Rami in welcoming him to the show. If you have any questions for our guest today, please leave them in the comments section below. That being said, we hope you enjoy today's episode. Without further ado, are you ready to take it to the top? A few moments later. All right, Patrick, welcome to episode 18 of Taking You to the Top. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to be here. My pleasure. Um, so to get us started, if you could introduce yourself, maybe take us back from the beginning so we know what the journey looked like from the start to becoming the founder of uh, Profit Law. Yeah, totally. And uh, I'll try to make it as short and coherent as possible because there's a lot, obviously a lot of different things. So I, I grew up in uh, central U.S., so in, in the Midwest, as it's called, um, in Wisconsin. Uh, so basically grew up in a town of more cows than people, which is the, the old joke here. And um, Yeah, I moved, I uh, went to university in Illinois, then ended up in D.C., worked for U.S. intelligence for a little while, um, and then I worked at Google. Um, that's what brought me to Boston. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been a bit of fun ride in the world of tech, and I was at Google uh, for a little while before jumping into kind of the startup scene um, sure. and starting ProfitWell. And what ProfitWell is is uh, we help subscription companies with their revenue operations, um, specifically helping them with a free set of subscription financial metrics. Um, you can plug in Stripe, Braintree, Recharge, whatever you're using to get all of your metrics for free, and then we make money by helping them with their pricing and also reducing churn. And so. Yeah, it's been a good journey um, to give kind of the, as the back of the baseball card stats, as they say. We, uh, um, we're about 70 people in Boston, Salt Lake City, and Rosario, Argentina. Um, and then um, we have uh, about 20% of the entire subscription market using the free product, which is great. Um, and we're right around $10 million in revenue, which is also, also a good time. Perfect. And was the company bootstrapped, or did you raise capital? Yeah, so we're bootstrapped. We're completely bootstrapped, which means, uh, or customer funded, I think is the, the funner, more fun way to say that now. Um, but yeah, we, and it wasn't, I mean, some people, they're very uh, opinionated about VCs and stuff. We weren't, it's not like we had a chip on our shoulder. I think it was, you know, we were able to get good, you know, funding from our customers and that kind of worked out. I think we'll, we'll probably raise money at some point, um, but it's not something that we're, we're raising, you know, currently. Which is, I mean, for me, that's amazing. The whole point of this podcast is to teach entrepreneurs who are just starting their journey that actually you don't need to just go out and raise because everybody else is raising. Um, you can really be very successful bootstrap. But if you don't mind, I have a small question related to this. 
Sure. When you first started the company, are you able to share how much you actually put into it? Um, yeah, sure. So I uh, basically, so in the States, we have 401ks typically for retirement. Um, and so, or there's a lot of other retirement accounts and that's not what the podcast is about. But uh, basically I had started saving, you know, in that um, when I started just working, you know, in general, um, even when I was a teenager, you know, working. And so there wasn't much in there because um, I was 25 when I started the company. There was, I think, uh, something around like fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000. And then if you take that money out, um, you end up getting taxed very, very heavily um, because you're not taking it out in your retirement. So I think it ended up being, you know, right around 10 grand. And so for me, that was just to live. So I took, you know, obviously my salary to zero. I didn't have a lot of savings, um, you know, again, because I was young. Um, and it was one of those funny things where basically we, um, you know, we, and when I say we, it was just me, um, basically took that $10,000 and, and lived on for about six months. And then within the first six months, we were able to get um, our first few customers. And basically, I think we, our first six months, which was 2012, the last end of 2012, uh, we basically sold, I think it was like $130,000 worth of product. Uh, so within those six months, we were able to, uh, me, again, I was able to basically get to a world where I could pay myself a little bit. I could hire Peter, who um, is still with the company, and he kind of runs our, our revenue teams, and then kind of go from there. So with that with that 10K, I mean, did you need to put some of it, allocate some of it for development? I'm assuming. Uh, no, you do sort of. Part? Yeah, not really. So I have I have these like part time co founders. Um, they're more advisors than anything, and so they were helping with with some of the development. Um, and I know a little bit of development. By no means was I like I, 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 am I a developer and engineer, but I was able to kind of like debug things and like work work things out here and there. Uh, sure. And we the way we kind of structured things was less on you know we had this product, this app, this pure software product, but we knew that there were a lot of gaps, and it was one of those things where we thankfully were in a market where we could kind of get paid to do our customer development. And what I mean by that is basically putting some service on top of the software. Um, and we found this out by finding people who were asking us, Hey, can you come help us, you know, talk through this. Right. And we were first kind of like, ah, I don't know, services, VCs don't like those. Right. Yeah. Uh, but we were like, we're, we're not raising money and it was a good sum of money, um, you know, in order to, to do those deals. And so what ended up happening is we just kind of looked at, all right, well, we can, you know, start to gain some of this money and then we can reinvest it into the business, right? And that's when we started getting a flywheel going where we would sell more of our, our tech enabled service, which we still have, and then take that money and reinvest it into our engineering team to not only make that product better, but also all the other products that we've come out with. Perfect. Um, what would you say in the beginning when you first started the company was the most effective marketing channel. I mean, how did you get the word out there? You have yeah. an idea, you started a company and now you want to spread the word. What would you say is totally. the most effective channel? I think for us, it was just writing. Uh, so content. So you got to remember in like 2012, there was a lot of content and there was a lot of people publishing, but for particularly for our space, there wasn't as much out there. And what I have found is that no matter what you're doing, um, it's really good to educate people, your prospects, your customers, et cetera, for, for a couple of reasons. One, they will realize maybe that they have this problem and want to check out what you do. Um, or two, when they meet someone who has that problem, particularly with something like pricing, which was our only product at the time, they're going to refer that person who's like, oh, you should talk to Patrick about pricing, right? They seem to be doing something um, in that space. And so, what that kind of allows us to do is, is, is not only educate and get some SEO benefit, although when you're just starting out on content, like SEO isn't necessarily the target unless you're doing a huge campaign, but it allowed us to kind of like build that domain expertise. And now, you know, I'm almost struggling with, you know, being the pricing guy, um, you know, because of all the content that we pushed out, not that that's a bad thing. It's just more, we do more than pricing now. Right. So that's a whole other problem of getting people to realize we do more than pricing, but it was just content. And then, to get more specific, what we would do is um, we would share the content. I think we had, I had like a hundred people on our email list. Every blog post I published, like one to two a week, I would just send to the email list. 
And then based on that, um, we would get more people because they would forward it. And then I would post on, you know, I didn't have a large Twitter following at the time. They were posted on Twitter. And then I would also post it in LinkedIn groups and basically start getting some traffic and start getting some more people to sign up for the post. Uh, but then the flywheel just kind of goes. And I think the problem with a lot of people in content is they think, oh, it's got to be an overnight thing. It takes a long time to build a good following. Um, and you just kind of have to like put the effort in and put the grit in. I mean, it, it must have been over a span of maybe seven, eight years, right? You founded it in 2012? Yep. Okay, so it does yeah, take yeah. time to develop that list and the, the audience that you're content marketing to, right? Yeah, I mean, it takes time. I think it is it's it is less time than you think depending on the product, right? So if, if we're talking about a product where paid ads or other things would have worked, I would have tried to do that, right? Like I would have tried to do some of these other things, but we were talking about a product that is in a space that people don't necessarily um, wake up thinking, oh, I'm gonna work on my pricing today, right? Like kind of like, oh, I'm gonna like go sell to these people and send emails, you know, that type of thing. So I think it's one of those things where, yeah, it, it definitely is a grind, but you, you start to see, you're trying to find fans, basically. And you're trying to find those people who like what you're writing or need what you're writing or have people who also need what you're writing. And we would focus on things that basically no one was talking about. And I, I felt kind of bad at sometimes because when I write an article on pricing, the real pricing people, like the people who have these PhDs and stuff like that, they would, it would be very basic to them. They're like, yeah, we get it. Right. But I was kind of distilling it down for everyone else, you know, who wasn't, uh, who wasn't focused on it. And, and I think that that's what made it, you know, relatively successful is that it was very accessible, but it also felt that made them feel like they learned something and they were able to do something properly. Got it. Okay. Um, Patrick, this next section is more for those, like I mentioned, those who are just starting again and they want to, even actually not even just starting. They want to get started in entrepreneurship. They, they want to start some sort of a product or a service and they're looking for problems to solve. So this like set of questions is maybe just by asking these questions, you come up with a problem that somebody can yeah, solve. Yeah. I mean, over the course of, let's say the last few weeks, what's been your most present problem? Something that you sit there every day and you're like, oh, I don't want to handle this today. <laughs> yeah. Um, great question. There were two, yeah, I know you said more pressing, but there's two that kind of popped into mind and I don't know which one was more pressing. So I'm just going to say both. Uh, one, okay. um, quarterly planning cycles. Like some people use OKRs, some people do the big rocks theory, other people do a couple of different things. I think for us, it's it's this, and I don't know if it's avoidable, there's always this like push and pull of, all right, first draft, get opinions and feedback, next draft, so on and so forth, and then trying to make it align, um, you know, for everyone and everything's kind of feeding into the, the same thing. And I think that that's, uh, it takes like one central hub to do a lot of that work. And there's got to be a better way, either a theory around goals and, or a theory around management or just making sure that like the goals get looked at and tracked in terms of progress. Um, a lot of the tools that are out there for this are just so large and so big and so expensive. And it's like, maybe it's just our size, like, you know, 70 folks, we don't want something that's like made for 500 team, 500 person teams. Right. Um, so that was kind of pressing. And then the other pressing um, problem was really around, um, we have a multi-product strategy so meaning like we sell multiple products to the same like vertical and they don't all have the same persona, meaning we sell some products to product people, some products to marketers, et cetera. Um, but organizing teams and organizing, um, you know, uh, even just your marketing strategy for multiple products. Like how do I make sure I'm not hitting up the same people for the same things? How do I make sure that, you know, I'm not uh, annoying customers or prospects, these types of things. So yeah, that's another problem is like, how do you do better, I guess, workflows, you know, when you're selling multiple products. And would you say if somebody came up with a solution to that problem, it would be worth paying for? Um, 
The goals product, yes, but I think the problem with the goals product is it's kind of like project management software. Everybody is different. So if they came up with the, the solution that fit our company perfectly, like absolutely, right? But it's one of those things where I think that if you came up with the perfect solution for us, the market is probably not big enough. And this is where a lot of project management software and I think a lot of the goal software ends up being very um, fractured, uh, just in terms of like there's so many different features that they have to build. And then when you build all those features, your, your costs start to balloon and things like that. Um, the other product, a better workflow product, yeah, we would totally pay for something like that. Something that was built for multi-product companies. I just, again, I don't know if there's enough of those multi-product companies out there to, to justify that. Sure. All right, uh, Patrick, let's wrap up with the famous five, if you don't mind. Let's do it. All right, number one, what's your favorite business book? Uh, I'm a big fan of High Output Management by Andy Grove. Um, I read it probably twice a year. Um, it's just a really good primer on, on management and just thinking through problems and things like that. Great. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Um, I've researched a lot about Bloomberg. Um, just from, I don't know if he's necessarily, I don't know, like I, not, not much about him and his CEO style, more about how he built Bloomberg, the company, um, cause it's kind of like a media company plus a software company, um, and a hardware company if you think about it. And so I've been studying a lot of that. And then I've been listening to a couple of books right now on the Koch brothers, um, or the Koch family, I should say, who started Koch industries, which is the largest, uh, private uh, private company in the world, I believe. Maybe it's second to Cargill. Uh, but just learning a lot from them because their story is really interesting on how their management style, um, as well as the, the, the kind of the bets that they went after were able to kind of scale. Um, it doesn't get into any of their politics and stuff like that. So I, I've been avoiding anything on that because that's, that's, that's always fun to get into. Absolutely. Um, number three, what's your favorite online tool for growing your business? Ooh, I think right now I've been really enjoying, so I've, there's two answers. One, the most used is probably Notion. So we write a lot and as you get bigger, like writing becomes really important because you have to codify things and people have big questions to things and you want to make sure you answer them in a, in a way that everyone can access. Um, and then the other kind of tool is um, I have this really slick uh, video and audio setup. Um, I'm using what's called an ATEM Mini Pro and a Stream Deck to do um, basically, um, you know, stream and, and record. And we do a lot of content, so that's been really helpful uh, to to basically, you know, grow our business when we don't have events and things like that to to, to go to. Okay, um, I'd actually like to know more about that setup, but maybe that's for a different conversation because right. obviously, when uh, these little bad boys break or don't work you need a bad yeah one, so. <laughs> um, totally. all right um number four if you could give your 20 year old self a piece of advice what would that be um don't be such a jerk no uh, <laughs> um i think focus on uh yeah i'd probably say something along the lines of like focus on calming your demons as much as possible. I think when, when you're young, we all got demons, you know, some very bad, some, you know, not so bad, but it's not a contest. Um, and I think that we don't focus enough on ourselves, like developing ourselves. Um, there's some people who just had really good mentorship and stuff early on that do this, but enough of us who let's just say have average, you know, mentorship, um, you know, either whether it's teachers, parents, et cetera, we, we tend to kind of focus on either the, the rat race, as they say, or certain skills and trying to like get to, well, I got to get to that level, then that level. And you don't realize that that's a very short term game. Um, and if you focus on yourself and clearing not only your demons, but figuring out how to learn and how you best learn and how you best work, that pays off substantially in the long run. Um, and so it's better to focus there than to focus on kind of the, the short-term sugar of, you know, little milestones at work or, you know, certifications and things like that. I agree with that for sure. Um, number five, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? 
Um, I used to be really bad, especially with travel, because I would do a lot of red eyes. Uh, but since since all the craziness started, I can actually tell you, um, with my little app here, I am getting on average. So I got eight hours last night, which is good. I think I'm getting an average of about six and a half to seven hours a night. So uh, that's been good for me. I think, uh, you know, sometimes I push it to five and sometimes I, I push it to 10, depending on the weekend or the weekday or whatever ends up happening. But the one piece of sleep advice that's worked really well for me, um, just learning how a sleeper you are, like what type of sleeper, um, and also what makes you like really fulfilled um, and also waking up at the same time every day. Yep. So I wake up at 4 a.m. every single day. I just learned that like that's when I do my best work is when I wake up at 4, um, I get to the office around 5 and, and you know, start working. It just works in my schedule and in my mindset really, really well. I, I don't want to dwell on the sleep part, but have you noticed that with sleep, um, if you just adjusted that to like say 3.45, it would like ruin your mood or your day? Um. You know, I haven't looked at that yet. Up at the wrong time, sometimes just destroy. Can throw you off. Yeah. I've noticed it's been really weird the past. I noticed it in the past four weeks. Um, basically, I will wake up before my alarm. Like I will wake up. Like I basically will wake up, and I think my body. I've just been very disciplined about the four a.m. And then, what that's allowed me to do, and I've been doing this for a while, but the 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 noticing was in the past four weeks is that. I'll basically wake up and I'll, I'll almost, it, it won't ruin my day, but I'll be a little like, cause I don't know. Cause I put my phone or my, my alarm across the room. So there's no clock for me to see. And so sometimes I wake up and I'm like, Oh no, it's like 2 AM. And I, I, I woke up and I should get more sleep or something, but really it's like 3:55, um, which is, which has been working out really well. So I'm not quite a robot yet, but I think I'm getting there. All right, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thanks for giving me some of your time. And I really hope that maybe in a year's time, we could follow up and see where things have gone. Any new projects pop up, it would be really cool. Yeah, sounds good. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible is a seller and producer of spoken audio entertainment, information, and educational programming on the internet. Audible sells digital audiobooks, radio and TV programs, and audio versions of magazines and newspapers. To start using Audible today, please visit their website at www.audible.com. That's www.audible.com.